All right. Well, welcome to this Election Matters 2022 panel on redistricting and the Voting Rights Act. My name is Rob Yablon. I'm a professor at the University of Wisconsin Law School and faculty co-director of the State Democracy Research Initiative, which is co-hosting this event together with the university's Elections Research Center. The Election Matters series is sponsored by the law firm of Stafford Rosenbaum. And in a moment, I'll be turning things over to Doug Poland, a partner at Stafford and also the litigation director of Law Forward, a nonprofit legal organization based in Madison, to introduce our panelists. Doug has himself been deeply involved in redistricting litigation and other democracy related matters, including the Wisconsin partisan gerrymandering challenge that reached the US Supreme Court several years ago, and the latest round of wrangling over the state's new electoral maps. Um, before I turn it over to Doug, uh, one bit of preliminary housekeeping regarding continuing legal education. This event was approved for one Wisconsin CLE credit by the Board of Bar Examiners. Please listen for the passcode to be given at around 12.55 p.m. And also then watch for a Google form link in the chat box. Uh, complete that Google form with the correct passcode by 5 p.m. Central Time today to get your CLE credit. So with that, over to Doug. Thanks very much, Rob, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, Stafford Rosenbaum is very pleased to sponsor today's program. Along with Jeff Mandel, I co-chair the election and political law practice at Stafford Rosenbaum, which is a full service law firm based in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we have a really terrific panel for you today, uh, and I will introduce them all now. Michael Lee serves as senior counsel for the Brennan Center's Democracy Program, where his work focuses on redistricting, voting rights, and elections. Before joining the Brennan Center, Michael practiced law at Baker Botts LLP in Dallas for 10 years. He was the author of a widely cited blog on redistricting and election law issues that the New York Times called indispensable. He's a regular writer and commentator on election law issues, appearing on PBS NewsHour, MSNBC, and NPR, and in print in the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and many other national publications. In addition to his election law work, Michael previously served as executive director of B1 Texas, a donor alliance that oversaw strategic and targeted investments in nonprofit organizations, working to increase voter particip participation and engagement in historically disadvantaged African-American and Hispanic communities in Texas. Asim Mulji is legal counsel for redistricting at the Campaign Legal Center in Washington, DC. Asim litigates voting rights, redistricting and campaign finance cases, and supports advocacy efforts to improve democracy at the federal, state, and local levels. Asim previously worked at the Participatory Budgeting Project, where he supported efforts to expand participatory democracy in the United States. At CLC, Asim serves as counsel in voting rights and redistricting cases, including Tennessee NAACP versus Lee, Vote America versus Schwab, and Soto Palmer versus Hobbs. In his role at CLC, Asim also works to advance various democracy reforms, including state level voting rights acts, ranked choice voting, public financing, and measures to ensure ballot access for justice involved voters. Aaron Murphy is a soon to be partner at the newly formed law firm Clement and Murphy based in Washington, DC. Aaron's practice focuses on Supreme Court, appellate and constitutional litigation. She has argued three cases before the United States Supreme Court including successfully arguing McCutcheon versus FEC, successfully arguing on behalf of the US House of Representatives in Texas versus United States, and arguing on behalf of the Wisconsin legislature in Gill versus Whitford. Erin also has a robust practice before the US Court of Appeals, where she has presented argument before most of the circuits on several important statutory and constitutional questions, including the scope of the Second Amendment, the Takings Clause, and the National Labor Relations Act. Fernita Tolson is Vice Dean for Faculty and Academic Affairs and the George T. and Harriet E. Flager Chair in Law at the University of Southern California Gould School of Law. She also holds a courtesy faculty appointment in the Political Science and International Relations Department at the USC Dornsife College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. Vice Dean Tolson's scholarship and teaching focus on the areas of election law, constitutional law, legal history, and employment discrimination. She's written on a wide range of topics, including partisan gerrymandering, political parties, the elections clause, the Voting Rights, of Act, Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the 14th and 15th Amendment. Vice Dean Tolson's research has appeared or will appear in leading law reviews, 
She's one of the co-authors of the leading election law casebook, The Law of Democracy, and her forthcoming book, In Congress We Trust, Enforcing Voting Rights from the Founding to the Jim Crow Era, will be published in 2023. Welcome to all of our panelists, and I'll turn it back over to Rob. Thank you, Doug, and thank you so much to the panelists for being here with us today. I'm really looking forward to hearing from all of you. In terms of format, I'm going to begin by uh, offering myself some initial background on redistricting and the Voting Rights Act. My hope is that this will be a useful primer for those who may not be steeped in this area of law and, uh, and that it will help provide a jumping off point for our panelists. Our panelists will then each take about six to eight minutes to offer opening comments focusing on any aspects of this topic that they'd like to highlight. And at that point, we'll have discussion and Q&A. Uh, I have some questions that I'd like to ask, but we also want to hear your questions. And we invite you to submit questions using the Q&A function uh, on Zoom. Now, uh, just to be clear, the Q&A function is distinct from the chat function. And I'll try to get to as many of those questions as I can, uh, potentially combining or synthesizing them as I go in an effort to squeeze more in. So by way of background, since last August, when the Census Bureau released results from the 2020 census, we have seen mapmakers across the country scrambling to draw new federal, state, and local electoral districts. And we've seen some extensive litigation over those lines with more to come. Uh, to perhaps oversimplify a bit, many of the biggest controversies about redistricting fall into one of two buckets. First, disputes frequently arise about whether electoral maps fairly represent political majorities. Second, concerns are often raised about how electoral maps treat political minorities. So with respect to majorities, there is no guarantee in a district-based system that you will end up with proportional representation. A political party preferred by a majority of a state's voters might not win a majority of the legislative seats, or a party preferred by a bare majority might find itself with a supermajority of seats. Such outcomes can occur for multiple reasons, but the most, most notorious reason is gerrymandering. In the majority of states, state legislators uh, or other partisan actors are responsible for drafting congressional and state legislative districts, and they often seek to tilt the playing field in their party's favor. In 2019, the US Supreme Court held in Rucho versus Common Cause that as a federal constitutional matter, partisan gerrymandering claims are non-justiciable. The court suggested that opponents of gerrymandering should instead seek relief at the state level or in Congress. And we've seen a growing number of states actually shift redistricting authority to nonpartisan or bipartisan commissions. These reforms have mostly been adopted using direct democracy mechanisms that are not available here in Wisconsin. This redistricting cycle, we've also seen a number of partisan gerrymandering claims get adjudicated in state courts, and several state courts have invalidated maps on state constitutional grounds. As many in the audience will know, we had a somewhat distinctive situation in Wisconsin where the state Supreme Court was asked to draw lines itself after the political branches deadlocked. One important question in that case was whether the court was required to reject politically biased maps, and the majority ultimately held that it would not try to ensure partisan fairness when it adopted maps. Moving forward, major questions are looming about the extent to which state courts and redistricting commissions may continue to check or supplant state legislatures, at least when it comes to congressional redistricting. As some of you may have seen just today, the US Supreme Court granted cert in what could be a blockbuster case from North Carolina involving the so-called independent state legislature theory. That case, Moore versus Harper, could seriously hamstring state reforms in the redistricting context and beyond, uh, and I expect that we'll hear more on that from our panelists. Well, what about the bucket of issues involving representation for minorities? And here we're dealing primarily with racial and ethnic minority groups. Depending on the geographic distribution of minority voters, there's no guarantee of electoral success at all in a district-based system. As a matter of federal constitutional law, communities of color that find themselves unable to elect their preferred representatives can get relief only if they're able to show that map makers deliberately underrepresented them, which can be a difficult standard to meet. Partly because of that difficulty, Congress four years ago amended Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act to protect against electoral uh, rules that produce discriminatory results, regardless of the intent behind them. In the redistricting context, this provision has enabled large and politically cohesive communities of color to bring claims for vote dilution, essentially arguing that a map gives them too few opportunities to elect their preferred representatives. 
Notably, Section 2 has long been understood to require some degree of race consciousness in districting. Map makers who seek to comply with the law often look for uh, the presence of large and geographically compact minority communities and try to ensure that they're not needlessly divided. Meanwhile, when litigating Section 2 cases, communities who believe that they have been underrepresented usually begin by trying to show that it would have been possible for map makers to create more districts in which they would have had electoral opportunities. This sort of race consciousness, however, stands in growing tension with other trends at the US Supreme Court where majorities have shown growing skepticism of race conscious decisions and remedies. Indeed, the Supreme Court has already weakened the protections of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act outside of the redistricting context. And this all may come to a head soon in the redistricting context because the US Supreme Court has granted cert uh, in two uh, Section 2 redistricting cases. The first, Merrill versus Milligan from Alabama, will be argued this coming October. The second, which the court just granted earlier this week, is from Louisiana. It presents similar issues and will likely be disposed of with the Alabama case. In both cases, lower courts held that under established doctrine, the plaintiffs had uh, shown that the maps drawn by the legislature diluted the state's African-American votes. The legislative maps, uh, congressional maps in each state included only one majority black district, even though a second such district in each state could readily have been drawn and would have resulted in representation much closer to proportionality. In a potential sign of things to come, the US Supreme Court put both of those lower court decisions on hold and will allow the legislatively drawn maps to operate this year. Again, I expect that we'll hear more about these cases uh, and what may lie ahead with respect to the Voting Rights Act from our panelists. So uh, with that background, I'd now like to turn things over first uh, to Fernita Tolson. Uh, Fern uh, Fernita, please take it away. Thank you so much, Rob. I appreciate the invitation. Um, I wish it was under slightly better circumstances. I'm talking about the independent state legislature doctrine um, and the, the court cert grant in Moore versus Harper. Um, so um, as Rob mentioned, the independent state legislature theory provides that state legislatures are not constrained um, by their respective state. state. Con Am I frozen? Oh, okay, because my box isn't lit up green. I'm just making sure everybody can hear me. Okay. Um, so the independent state legislature theory provides that state legislatures are not constrained um, by their respective state constitutions in exercising the authority that the U.S. Constitution delegates to states over federal elections. So effectively in overseeing the mechanics of federal elections from regulating the time, places, and manner of federal elections under the elections clause of Article 1, Section 4, to appointing electors under the presidential electors clause of Article 2, Section 1, um, state legislatures under, under this theory can disregard state court interpretations of state constitutions. So of course you can imagine the parade of horribles that could result if the Supreme Court validates this theory, um, which they prob probably will, if I'm you know, being predictive here. Um, you can have situations where a partisan state legislature can declare a failed election um, and then allocate the state's electoral votes to the popular vote loser. Um, you can have a situation where state legislatures ignore state constitutional provisions that protect the right to vote and enact state legislation that will be prohibited by that state constitution. Um, or you can have the outright invalidation of independent redistricting commissions uh, to draw lines for congressional um, seats. So in other words, it's a real shit show. I can't think of any other way to describe it. <laughs> um, and, and of course, scholars have offered a number of criticisms uh, of the theory, right? So uh, notably, um, there have been arguments that it runs counter to the lawlessness of state legislatures that the uh, founding generation was concerned about. Um, there have been arguments that it's contrary to historical practice at the founding um, and practice that developed soon after ratification of the Constitution. Um, and, and more recently, you've seen arguments that it undermines the constitutional structure um, in which you have a more democratically accountable Congress rather than the states um, who are invested with final say over federal elections. So in my scholarship, I've tried to build on this body of work and uh, point out that there's an even more basic textual and historical reason that the doctrine does not work. So specifically, if you look at the text of the electors clause of Article 2, um, it provides, quote, each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in Congress, end quote. So this, this text, in my view, explicitly raises the question of who is the state on behalf of which the legislature deploys power? So I use this language in order to show that the state referenced in this provision 
is actually the citizens and not the state legislature, which is why they are mentioned separately here. I mean, the citizens, their preferences are actually conveyed through the voting public to the legislature. Um, and historical practice bears this out. Within a decade of the founding, the, selected, the selection of elected officials by the state's electorate became central to the theory of republicanism underlying the guarantee clause of Article 4, which predicated the legitimacy of government on majority support. So the notion of a state legislature bypassing the preferences of the majority to enact its own preferred candidates or own preferred election laws is not only undemocratic, um, it's also unrepublican. By the early 19th century, republicanism required that state legislatures and to a lesser extent federal officials be accountable to the people who elected them. Accountability that prevented state legislatures from exercising their authority over federal elections in a way that disregarded the preferences of the people. Note that this is a very distinct argument though from one in which the people can hold elected officials accountable for bad decisions at election time. So this whole theory of vote them out. The requirement that state legislatures act in ways consistent with majority, majority principles is actually an ongoing obligation. So it doesn't just apply at election time. Um, another provision of the constitution that bolsters this theory is the 12th amendment. Um, the 12th amendment also embraced a vision of article two in which the legitimacy of the presidency was tied to a de decisive electoral college win sanctioned by a majority of the voters in the state, either directly through popular election or indirectly through their state legislatures. So the amendment was intended to prevent candidates who lack majority support from becoming president. In some ways, Chiafalo versus Washington, which the Supreme Court embraced sort of this voter centered view of Article Two, is about the state's attempt to hold electors accountable to the people in real time, so as to not undermine the, le the legitimizing function of majoritarian sentiment. In Chiafalo, the Supreme Court held that states could replace or find presidential electors that did not cast their votes in accordance with the winner of the state's popular vote, as required by state law. In rejecting the argument for elector independence under Article II, the court recognized the role of both political parties and electors as conduits of majority preferences, such that states can punish and or remove uh, electors who cast ballots for individuals other than the winner of the popular vote in the state. The court endorsed a post 12th amendment vision of the electoral college in which the amendment quote, brought the electoral college, college's voting procedures into line with the nation's new party system, end quote, and codified the expectation that the elector would quote, vote the regular party ticket and there, thereby carry out the desires of the people who had sent him to the electoral college, end quote. Or as the Chiafalo majority succinctly put it, no independent electors need to apply. So if you think about this in the context of the independent state legislature's theory, um, particularly in its strongest iteration in which the state legislature can act independent of the state courts and the state constitution, indeed independent of popular sentiment, it runs counter to this democratizing effect that the 12th amendment was intended to have on presidential electors, elections. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you so much and I welcome your questions. Thank you so much for that, Vernita. Uh, Michael, we're going to go to you next. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me for this very timely and a, a, a hope informative panel. What I'm going to talk today about is the Voting Rights Act and where we are and where we may be going. Because I, I you know, the Supreme Court will hear um, a really important case about how you interpret a key provision of the Voting Rights Act in October. It will be, I think, the second case argued this term. Um, and I really do think that we are in a lot of ways at an inflection point, because um, I think there have been a lot of signals, uh, mainly on the court, court shadow docket, um, but also in some of the other things that they have done. Um, that This is a court that is very skeptical about the use of race and not only the use of race in redistricting, but the use of race in American life altogether, you know, the, the same um, at the same term that the court is going to hear this case out of Alabama, it's also going to hear affirmative action cases uh, out of Harvard and the University of North Carolina. So th this will be, if, if the, the recently concluded term was about abortion and guns, this coming term will in a lot of ways be about race. And I do think that a lot of the justices, um, uh, almost certainly a majority, um, have, have serious questions about uh, how we use race um, in, in particularly around redistricting. And I think you see that in a decision on the shadow docket out of Wisconsin where um, you know, the, Wisconsin, the 
redistricting process deadlocked in Wisconsin, uh, the state Supreme Court had to step in and it picked a plan that it created an additional black district. It didn't pick the plan because it created additional black district. It picked a plan that happened to create an additional black uh, assembly district. Um, and the US Supreme Court intervened and sent it back um, to the Wisconsin Supreme Court and said, no, you can't do this. You know, you have to show that you really have a really, really good reason for doing race-based districting, despite the fact that the Wisconsin Supreme Court actually wasn't engaging in any kind of race-based districting. In fact, it recognized that, you know, people could challenge perhaps the map on any number of grounds and, and the appropriate place would be for, in a suit uh, that was brought uh, doing exactly that. Um, and I think that you know, you also see in the fact that it stayed the draw redrawing of Alabama's uh, congressional map to create a second black opportunity district to state the Louisiana uh, redrawing of its map, uh, which would have created uh, a second black opportunity district. Um, you know, in, in, in situations where, you know, in Alabama, you know, the, the panel that ruled in Alabama included two Trump appointees out of the three judges. And you know, it is was by no means a very radical panel. Um, in the Louisiana case, um, the Fifth Circuit, of all people, refused to stay the redrawing of a map in an, an opinion by uh, which Judge Jerry Smith was a part of, and he's a very conservative Reagan appointee on the Fifth Circuit. You know, they said like, no, like there's no grounds for staying this decision, um, and the Supreme Court stayed it. Um, which I think tells you that they really are prepared to perhaps revisit. The doctrine, perhaps, you know, I think there's some people who would say that they, they perhaps are going to declare Section 2 in, uh, the, the, uh, unconstitutional altogether. I think that, that they also could, I think it's probably more likely that they will just rewrite the test in ways that make it much harder to use functionally. And and let's stop and think about like what that actually means. Like, because if you have all the places, like if, you, if Section 2 does not apply on the facts and circumstances of Alabama, uh, where there's such sharply sharp racially polarized voting where you could easily draw a second black district that just stretches along the southern part of the state through the black belt, um, a region that has lots of commonality that sort of like, you know, been, you know, has hundreds of years of shared history that has similar economies and, and demographics and, and, you know, lots of lots of things in common. If you if you can't be required to draw a black district there, um, you really, it's really hard to see how the how the Voting Rights Act would apply anywhere. And I think, um, you know, the Voting Rights Act already was getting a little bit harder to use outside of that context, um, mainly because most people of color now live in the suburbs, <laughs> not in the cities and, and, and urban areas. And so, um, you know, already was getting like, you know, Section 2 actually doesn't apply that many places, right? It applies to a limited number of circumstances in situations like Alabama and the fact that, um, you know, the Supreme Court seems concerned about that, I think, is a, is a powerful signal. I do think race-based districting can be defended, but I do think that a lot of us um, probably need to do a little bit better job of doing that. Um, I think in a lot of ways, um, you know, we, we have gotten used to describing when you have a right to a Section 2 district, mainly based on numerosity. The Latino population has grown, therefore there should be more Latino districts. Um, you saw this in New York, where people argued that Latino communities in Manhattan should be joined to a district across the river with Latino communities in Brooklyn and Queens. And, it, and you ask people like, well, why? Well, because they're Latino, they should be in a Latino district. Well, they're also part of Manhattan, right? You know, and I think, you know, like, you know, like there's, there's an argument, but I think, you know, it, it can't just be based on numbers. And I think if you just do it based on numbers, I think this is a Supreme Court that is increasingly going to say like that is essentializing race. You're assuming that people are all alike and, and why are you putting that over you know, like the Latinos in Manhattan, why is it more important that they be in a Latino district than they be in a, in a Manhattan district if they have concerns with their neighbors who are non-Latino in Manhattan, the Chinese community next door, the, you know, white people in the, the, the in, in lower Manhattan, right? And so I think, you know, that is, you know, I think, I think, you know, we have gotten a little bit sloppy and I'd say we, I mean, the practitioners, I think the press, you know, like you see a lot of press reports, like here's the number of majority black districts, right? You know, and it's like, well, has it fallen? Has it risen? It's like, well, you know, like there's not, it's not as though in some cases you do need black majority districts and some places you don't. And so like, you know, the benchmark isn't actually how many districts are majority black. It's how many, it, you know, it's a, it's a more complicated and nuanced inquiry. And I think that we, 
we, you know, if we're going to defend race-based districting in certain instances, we need to be very clear about what we're doing. I think given where the court is, I think we also need to be thinking about what the future of representation looks like in a quote unquote race blind world, you know, so that may be where we're at. And I don't think it's just the Voting Rights Act that will increasingly be challenged. I think things like um, community of interest requirements in California, uh, the, you know, California comes the California Constitution says you're supposed to keep communities of interest together, and it, it says and it defines communities of interest as perhaps including racial and ethnic communities. I think the the Supreme Court is going to say that's racially essentializing, and you're, you you can't do that. I think in Florida there is an amendment. Um, part of the Florida Constitution that says like you you can't retrogress anywhere in the state. And so a black district can't become less effective. I think Governor DeSantis and others have signaled that they think that that violates the federal constitution because why should a black district never ever go backwards, right? You know, and, and like, you know, like, yes, that was a standard under section five, but section five, you had to be covered by that. You had to have a history of discrimination. So even parts of Florida that don't have uh, discrimination under the Florida constitution, um, you, you you know, that that does apply. So I, I think there's going to be a wholesale attack um, by our friends on the right um, about the use of race in society. And I, I do think that we have to begin thinking about what it looks, what it means and what it looks like to have fair representation in a more race blind world. So I will stop there and turn it back to you. All right, thank you so much, Michael. And uh, Asim, we'll go to you next. Sure, um, and thank you for you know, thank you to the State Democracy Initiative for having me on this panel. I feel like uh, one of these is not like the other. Uh, it's really great to be part of a conversation with uh, really heavy hitters in the voting rights and redistricting world. Um, I think my remarks will flow nicely from Michael's, um, which I think really well summarize the sort of concerns that we have about the Voting Rights Act going into um, the Supreme Court's uh, coming decisions in the Alabama and Louisiana cases. And I'm gonna take my time to talk about um, what I think is uh, an emerging reform opportunity um, to protect racial and ethnic minorities from discrimination in the redistricting process and election systems at the, at the local level. Um, and that's uh, state level voting rights acts. Um, so state level voting rights acts are you know, laws designed to end racial discrimination in voting. Um, like the Federal Voting Rights Act um, that are enacted at the state level, um, modeled on the Federal Voting Rights Act, um, which has been our main topic of discussion today, um, but uh, also that enhance the protections provided by the Federal Voting Rights Act. They generally only apply to election systems at the local level, so cities, counties, school districts, um, and have generally have been focused on protecting racial and ethnic minority groups from vote dilution in local election systems, uh, like at large election systems, and gerrymandered district-based election systems. Um, and like the Federal Voting Rights Act, uh, which also applies to local election systems, that is sort of the, the harm that state voting rights acts have thus far been, been aimed to cure. Um, these laws uh, are still relatively rare in the states. Um, so far, just a handful of states have enacted a state voting rights act. Uh, California in 2002, Washington and Oregon in 2018 and 2019, and then Virginia last year, and then just recently, I think in the last month, um, the state of New York enacted what we think is um, one of the strongest voting rights acts uh, at the state level. Um, so I guess, why should we be thinking about state VRAs at all? Um, if you're interested in keeping racial discrimination out of voting and ensuring fair representation in local government, um, then state VRAs can really offer uh, a number of benefits. And I'll, I'll highlight just a couple of, uh, or I guess a few of those in, in the time that I have. Um, the first is that you know, state VRAs can, like I said, supplement and enhance the protection of the Federal Voting Rights Act and codify those protections in state law so that state courts have the final authority over their meaning and scope. Um, as Michael mentioned, you know, this is really important because the federal Supreme Court you know, continues to cut away at and artificially limit the broad protections found in the plain text of the federal VRA. Um, and state VRAs can really sort of take things further. They can um, include a preclearance system to ensure that changes made to local election systems don't impose sort of racially dis disparate burdens um, along the lines of the preclearance system that the Supreme Court gutted in the 2013 uh, Shelby County Beholder decision. Um, they can also codify less onerous legal standards um, that are more sensitive and better at detecting racially discriminatory voting systems on the federal VRA. Um, 
and that are you know, better calibrated to the unique racial and ethnic dynamics and geographies of the particular state where they're enacted. They can include helpful procedural requirements uh, like requiring pre-suit notice and negotiation between plaintiffs and local governments, uh, reducing the cost of, you know, the, the cost of enforcing your voting rights. Um, and state VRAs can also correct, I think, what is a major drawback of Federal Voting Rights Act litigation, notwithstanding anything that the Supreme Court's going to do in the next year, um, which is that even when you win a Federal Voting Rights Act case, federal courts typically allow the government, you know, the losing party, to decide how they're going to remedy um, the harm. And they get to pick, essentially, the government, the loser, says, I'm sorry I lost, but um, here's the election system that I think will, will cure the violation. And state VRAs can fix that by making explicit that you know, government defendants don't get deference in deciding how to remedy or fix a voting rights violation. Um, and the last sort of broad benefit of state VRAs is that they can include a broader range of remedies to cure racial vote dilution or denial. Um, in his initial remarks, Robert mentioned that, you know, uh, Cabin sort of his remarks with the, with the caveat that we're operating in a system where um, district-based remedies and redistrict and districting in general are the ways that we think about representation in legislative bodies. Um, but that's not the only way that we can operate. And state VRAs can allow for uh, other kinds of election systems to cure racial vote dilution or denial, like ranked choice voting, uh, cumulative voting, and other sort of alternative election systems. Um, and I'll, I'll just say the other sort of benefit of state VRAs is that you know they stand on firm constitutional footing. This is because you know, state VRAs involve state regulation of local government entities, like cities, counties, school districts. Supreme Court for uh, last century has you know made clear that states have absolute discretion in structuring and um, and governing their local government units. Um, and as the Supreme Court's made clear in its equal protection jurisprudence, states are free to enact racially neutral laws like anti-discrimination laws that we sort of have the benefit of, uh, of the any sort of anti-discrimination law to address racial discrimination in areas like employment, public accommodations, and there's no reason why that can't also extend to voting. Um, so I guess I'll stop there. And if there are other uh, questions about state VRAs, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks so much, Asim. And uh, Aaron, we'll go to you. Great. Um, well, as 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 the resident friend of the right, uh, you know, I, I I guess I'll talk a little bit about you know why um, why why. I agree with some of what's been said about where the court might be going, but uh, about how we got there and why it's maybe not such a, a terrible thing after all that uh, it may be where 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 this court is headed. Um, I'll talk in particular a little bit about uh, the Merrill case and and where things look like they may be headed in terms of how uh, of the law, particularly as to sort of racial gerrymandering, both as a constitutional matter and as a uh, statutory matter under the VRA. Uh, you know, th this is, I, I've been saying for quite some time to me, kind of been the biggest biggest difficult issue that courts have been facing for quite some time. This is this is not um, something new. Justice is going way back to, you know, Justice O'Connor had issues, Justice Kennedy raised issues about this, Justice Breyer has raised issues, just, uh, justices across the political, political spectrum have, have Acknowledge and lamented that that we've gotten to a point in the law that makes things extremely, extremely difficult for states to retain any actual control over their districting, and and here's why. Um, you know, so on the one hand, you have an a, a well-established doctrine about um, prohibiting racial gerrymandering as a constitutional matter, saying that you cannot uh, draw districts on the basis of race. Um, on the other hand, you have Section 2 of the VRA and used to have Section 5 of the VRA that say, you know, that create rights, that protect rights with respect to not discriminating on the basis of race when it comes to voting practices and redistricting, which at first sounds, you know, complementary, but uh, as was alluded to earlier, part of the goal in expanding Section 2 of the VRA to include not just intentional discrimination, but also discriminatory effects was to make it broader and to say, um, we're not only worried about when districts are drawn intentionally on the basis of race, but we're also worried about uh, when practices and, you know, there's some debate at this point about districts, but when when all of, when when voting laws are you know, enacted or, or or voting practices exist in a matter that has a disparate impact on race. 
where the tension comes in is if if you you know look at districts and say, okay, this wasn't drawn in a way that we think best best protects minorities, then what that means is the state has to then go district on the basis of race, which the the states have been told as a constitutional matter, they're not supposed to be doing. Um, So then states say, okay, well, you know, I got to comply with both of these things. Um, And and I'm being told that as a matter of the Voting Rights Act, I, I have to take race into account to ensure, you know, kind of the right balance of minority majority districts or looking more broadly at other types of voting practices. And and they do that. um, And then they get sued for racial gerrymandering. And they don't just get sued by, you know, people on the right. Um, The same parties on the right and left may, you know, sue a state for racial gerrymandering and then turn around and sue them for violating the Voting Rights Act or sue them under the Voting Rights Act and then turn around and sue and say their remedy, uh, their remedial map violates gerrymandering. Um, and, And that's, I think, all sort of an inevitable byproduct of the fact that when you're talking about drawing districts and it's it's just an inherently political practice. And there are many people who are litigating these cases in good faith in efforts to advance the interests of minority voters and ensure that there's not discrimination on the basis of race. But you know, to, to be perfectly candid, there are also many people who are litigating these issues from a very political perspective that doesn't have a heck of a lot to do with um, racial justice and equality and has a little bit more to do with how best to utilize race to advance their political outcomes. And that is, I will pretty say, an across the board thing to be said. It is not one party or the other. It is just part of politics and it's an unfortunate part of politics. And I think it's a big part of why the law has gotten to the place that it has gotten, where you have many justices across the political spectrum lamenting that states really are caught between a rock and a hard place. You know, they if they don't district on the basis of race, they're going to be accused of violating the Voting Rights Act. If they do district on the basis of race, they're going to be accused of violating the Constitution. And uh, having worked on the side of representing state legislatures and trying to help people who are just trying in good faith to draw maps that actually comply with all of their legal obligations. I mean, I am sometimes at a loss as to what to tell them other than you may have no choice but to challenge some aspect of the law because there isn't a great practical way for you to actually walk this line without facing a decade's worth of litigation over whatever districts it is you may draw plus you know another year's few years worth over challenges to the remedial districts after those districts get thrown out by whoever it may be um so it's it it really this is a real problem and i think anybody who works in this area would acknowledge that this is a real problem it's it it actually is difficult and you know people have different views about which states they think are doing it in good faith or bad faith or you know which political parties they think are better or worse but th- there there isn't really any denying that it is extremely difficult to be told that these these kind of you know just completely counter directives of use race and don't use race all at the same time now to date the the way you know that the court has tried to sort of reconcile all of this is to say that when it comes to gerrymandering challenges saying that you violated the constitution by using race um, the court will treat the use of race in an effort to comply with the voting rights act as a uh, you know as as sufficient to satisfy strict scrutiny, um, various courts have uh, you know treating that as a compelling interest and a good reason to use race. Various justices have you know some justices have have held that, other justices have assumed that without uh, deciding the question. Um, but but the court has tried its best to reconcile that tension by saying look, if we're talking about what you did on the front end and you took race into account, but you took race into account because you were trying to comply with your federal statutory obligations that require you to take race into account, then we're not going to turn around and fault you for that. Um, But I think it's become increasingly difficult. You know, there's so much debate and politics wrapped up in 
then you have the question of which efforts to comply with the Voting Rights Act are good faith, and when are we, you know, that you have a whole nother set of litigation of people who will say, well, you just claimed as a matter of pretext that you were considering race for the basis of um, complying with the Voting Rights Act, and really you were doing it, you know, for purely political reasons or even for more invidious reasons, and you still, you don't really get out of the litigation because you have that whole nother set of litigation about who is, you know, wh wh whether we take it at face value when a state legislature says, Yes, we know we're considering race, but we're considering race because you've, I, I know a decade of case law has told us that we have no choice but to consider race. And, and that litigation, and then just to kind of add to the last layer of you know, complexity and difficulty for the Supreme Court is a, a decent amount of that litigation is a litigation that the Supreme Court cannot avoid hearing. Um, because the Supreme Court has one of the rare areas in which it has mandatory jurisdiction is certain cases rising out of the Voting Rights Act. So the court can't, you know, in the vast majority of things the Supreme Court does, it can deny cert and kind of wash its hands of it and leave it to the lower courts to resolve. But in all these three district Voting Rights Act cases, uh, you're not asking the court for cert, you're appealing to the Supreme Court and they, they whether they hear the case and your argument, um, they have no choice but to affirm or you know reverse or vacate. They have to act on the merits of the decision below. So you have this very messy area of constant litigation that's driven by a whole lot of different dynamics that the Supreme Court is you know kind of can't couldn't get itself out of even if it wanted to under the current regime. Um, so I think it's important to kind of have all of that you know, as background, when you think about what's going on here, that the court is is the one that's kind of sitting there dealing with this mess and seeing the, you know, that 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 there's so much mixed in here that is sometimes just pure politics that sort of lands at their doorstep. Um, and here we are at the beginning of another redistricting cycle when they've, you know, just barely wrapped up dealing with all the litigation they had from the last one. And, and you know, they've already got a few things on their plate. Um, so uh, with all of that as backdrop, then we come to uh, you know, the court having on its docket this year a case, Merrill, a Merrill v. Milligan, the case out of Alabama, that deals with a lot of these issues and really presents straight up the question of kind of, is there a way to interpret Section 2 narrowly enough to kind of get states out of this rock and a hard place? Um, and, and if there's not a way to do that, you know, is, is it time for the court to really take, really take up the argument of whether Section 2 at least is applied in the context of districting um, is, is constitutional, is consistent with these commands that we've understood to emanate from the 15th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause that states are not supposed to be taking uh, race into account when they draw districts, which again are commands that are not something that's been, you know, unilaterally imposed by the right side of the court. There are plenty of racial gerrymandering cases where the, the, the voting breakdown has been, you know, mixed or even the opposite direction with, uh, you know, with, 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 with just depending on the context. Um, so I, I do think, you know, that this case is, is really going to force some of those issues. Um, I, I don't think that means that this is a case that the only way the Supreme Court can decide it is by conclusively resolving that long present question that in particular, I think, you know, one of the justices who highlighted it um, uh, most most frequently was was Justice Kennedy. Um, but this this long lurking question of can you really reconcile uh, section two in, in all respects with the constitution. Uh, you know, I, I, if, if you'd asked me like a couple of years ago, even, or five years ago, I'd probably tell you it's much more likely that the court would find a way to avoid that question or to resolve the case in a way that, you know, deals more with statutory interpretation. Um, as we all, I think, you know, are still processing over the past kind of few weeks as we take the time to, Really take in the, the the cases that the court has decided and how it's decided them over the uh, over the past term, and we're still really learning about the new membership of a recently changed court. Like we have to you know, understand, I think we have a pretty good sign now that this isn't quite a minimalist driven court. Um, so I think these issues are, you know, I think that constitutional question is really really before the court, and and not something that I would count out the possibility of them actually taking up. Uh, 
while there are still at the same time, I will say plenty of ways, you know, that the court could end up resolving the case that are a, a little bit narrower. And I suppose the very last thing I would say is, you know, some of that may be may may depend a little bit on how everyone decides to litigate this case. Um, you know, if you take something like uh, the, the Dobbs decision earlier this week, the court talked about how, or last week, the court talked about how it was presented to the court by really everybody as this is an all or nothing decision. I mean, maybe there's a lesson to take from that, whichever kind of side you are on in litigation here of, you know, is this a court that you want to put to an all or nothing choice? Or is it a court where, you know, whichever side you're on, you want to make your best arguments, but also work really hard to offer what we call in litigation soft landings, um, ways for the court to, to resolve things a little more narrowly. Uh, you know, and, and see if there's an appetite for that. We're obviously dealing with some new justices and time will give us, a, we have a lot of time to still figure out exactly how, how they will operate. But I think the Merrill case is a really important one and, and going to be a really interesting one to watch. Thank you so much, Erin, and to all of the panelists for really thoughtful comments. Um, I will um, start us off with a couple of questions, uh, ones that kind of build on questions that have um, been submitted. And again, a reminder that uh, those in the audience are welcome to submit questions using the Q&A function. So my, my, my two questions are um, ones that uh, are going to you know, press you to uh, build on some of the prognosticating that you've already been doing. And, and I'll start with the independent state legislature theory and then go to the Voting Rights Act. So the Supreme Court is going to confront the question uh, this coming term of whether this is a, a, a viable theory. As Fernita helpfully pointed out, the independent state legislature theory has implications beyond redistricting, right? It, it could, uh, you know, for, for one thing, make it more difficult for um, states to assign redistricting authority, at least for congressional districts, to um, independent commissions. It could hamstring state courts, but it also has implications uh, for other types of voting rules for presidential elections. So uh, do you have thoughts on uh, the likelihood that the Supreme Court is going to adopt um, some version of this theory? And, and I say some version because uh, you know, we sometimes oversimplify and say, you know, either there's going to be an independent state legislature doctrine or not, but there are various gradations of it, um, some that are, you know, much more stringent than others. So uh, if you think it might be adopted, um, how stringent a version might we see? And a question from the audience that uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on too is, you know, how big a threat, if any, do you see that doctrine uh, to the health of our democratic system? Renita, could we go to you first since you've already had, you know, commented on it? Of course, I'm, I'm happy to take those questions. So how stringent will it be? So this is the interesting thing. Like, I think the, I'm, I'm pretty certain based on absolutely nothing that the court will adopt some version of this doctrine. Like, it's just, you know, my sense of where things have been headed with the court in recent cases, just, you know, adopting uh, interpretations of the constitution and of statutory prote provisions protecting the right to vote. Um, adopting inter interpretations that um, are not very protective of voters and are very deferential to the states suggest that, you know, in, in the Moore case, the court will also uh, recognize the independent state legislature theory um, as a, a way of further empowering state legislatures. So I just feel, you know, given what the case law is, that the natural next step is to recognize this doctrine. But Rob, I think you're right that we have to be clear that there are different versions of the doctrine. So you know, if you look at the cases this term, the court has been um, somewhat maximalist, right? Like I think one of the uh, distinctions between the Justice Roberts um, and the other conservatives in the Dobbs case is that he, he didn't necessarily think that the court had to gut row. Um, but, you know, he, he was still sort of on board with the, the limits on women's reproductive choice, right? But I think that at least five members of the court take a very expansive view of uh, a very, of really overturning um, uh, precedent and also um, creating this vision of society that um, they, they don't want to approach in a very incremental manner, right? They're approaching things very broadly. So it's possible they can adopt a version of the independent state legislature theory that empowers state legislatures to completely ignore state constitutions um, in how they legislate with respect to federal elections. That is possible. But it is also possible that they, get, they could adopt a, a, a more 
limited view of the doctrine. So for example, um, and I think historically it's important to point out that the doctrine hasn't been one consistent thing, right? It is it's possible they can adopt a view of the, the doctrine where um, these independent state legislature doctrine is a constraint on state officials um, who implement election regulations within the state. Um, and so in some, in some historical uses of the doctrine, um, it, it's more so about the relationship between the state legislature and state election officials, as opposed to the state legislature being free itself of the state constitution, right? So there's not one version of this doctrine that um, requires the court to adopt a version of it that is as maximalist as it can be. Uh, but let's be clear, the question presented in Moore uh, invites the maximalist uh, response. So even though the court doesn't have to be maximalist, the way the case is framed and has been litigated suggests that if the court finds that the independent state legislature theory is a thing, that they'll adopt the maximalist version, which is really unfortunate. Um, so I think that's both questions, right? How stringent and what was the second question? The second question was how much of a threat uh, you see the doctrine or, or maybe at least maximalist versions to the health of our democracy. Oh, it's a wrap. And let me, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a wrap. And let me explain why. It's a wrap because of our levels of polarization, right? So even if we could em envision a democracy where the independent state legislature doctrine will be enacted in sort of this good faith way, I think 2020 taught us that in the times that the doctrine came up, it was in undemocratic situations. Um, even in the 2000 election, when this doctrine was uh, battered around as a potential response to what was going on in Florida, it was framed as, well, the Florida state legislature can sort of ignore the election and allocate the electors consistent with this doctrine, right? So, and at the time, it was still disputed who actually won that election. Um, and so in, in that way, anytime you have a situation where you have a doctrine that could lead to election re results being advisory as opposed to being binding, that's not a democracy. So if they adopt a maximalist version of this doctrine, it's a wrap. Great. Uh, well, not great. Um, <laughs> uh, gr great answer, not great situation. Um, but let me ask if others want to weigh in on that, Asim or Michael or Aaron. I'm happy to weigh in with a couple thoughts. I mean, you know, just to offer a, a little bit different perspective. Um, you know, I think I, I think some might say what it would, would actually do is, uh, you know, ensure that elections kind of have a, a, a a rule of law on the front end that's going to govern them and that the worry is that a lot of politics come in on the back end um, with the litigation itself and that that's that that that's really you know a big part of the concern here is 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 not you know that there's some it's is that there's not some platonic answer of like oh there's the majority will it's that that the, the election results are supposed to be dictated by the rules that were set on the front end some of which has been noted like are are De designedly a little kind of counter majority counter majoritarian you know so that's that's why we put the rules at the front end and it's why we get really worried about the ability to sort of change the rules on the back end and i think that's a big driver in what was going on with a lot of the concerns and a lot of the reason that this doctrine is um you know getting gaining steam now but i would also say that that just as a more you know just observational point i mean it's really interesting and kind of uh, it, it, uh, an oddity of all of this is that the case came first in which the court, the Arizona Independent Districting Committee case came first in which the court was deciding whether independent districting committees are, are consistent with the constitution and whether you know districting has to be done only by a state legislature. And, and four members of the court, you know, dissented from that. And uh, if I'm thinking right, you know, most of them are maybe are, 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 are still there. And I suspect like a majority of this court doesn't think that decision was right. Um, but I don't think that decision is necessarily like on the table in this case. Um, but it, it it's an oddity to have the court resolving the question of kind of the extent to which courts can interfere with the legislature as the principal drawer of districts when you've kind of got justices who probably think what the court has said about who should be, you know, what it means for the legislature to be the principal drawer of districts is itself wrong. Um, and just makes this like a little bit, just for lack of a better word, goofy, um, the way that they have to process all of this constitutionally, kind of trying to create the rule against a system that, um, that you know, whether you agree with them or not, like, I think, I think most of them probably, the current membership of the court probably don't think it is right. Uh, and it seems to me, 
you know, for, for those who tend to think, you know, have, have, have share a little bit more of the views that I'm usually litigating. I think most people think like it's an easier question that you can't have independent districting commissions than the question of whether state courts can uh, enforce laws as to what the state legislature does. So you've kind of got them like in a backwards reverse order uh, that that just makes all of this a little bit unusual. Can we just note like the, the complete oddity in the North Carolina situation, which is that North Carolina law itself, specifically a law passed by the legislature specifically envisions that the courts will have a role, right, in, in, in forcing, um, you know, in, in, in redistricting, right? And it, it sort of talks about the process that happens if a court strikes down the map and all of that, like, you know, and, and all of that. And so it, it is a little bit odd, you know, it's not exactly the perfect vehicle for this, this claim. Um, but nonetheless, here we are. Um, to your question, Rob, I, I do think that there is a version of this where they, they, um, you know, because it, it is a very politicized thing. I mean, I think, you know, some of them may think like the North Carolina Supreme Court and striking down this map was politicized. I think people in the other side, it's like they're being politicized to taking this case, right? And I think that there is a version of this where they say like, oh, well, North Carolina couldn't do that because they relied on, you know, the free and fair elections clause of the North Carolina constitution to find a partisan gerrymander. But New York was fine because, you know, Republicans went and got the New York map struck down because the New York map, you know, the New York constitution specifically says you can't partisan gerrymander, right? And so there is a version of, you know, and I think that that suits people's political aims. Um, there's a principle behind it, but it also suits people's political aims. And so like a democratic gerrymander in New York gets struck down in North Carolina, Republicans, have at it because they didn't put the North Carolina Constitution doesn't say anything about partisan gerrymandering specifically. So I, 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 I do think like they will try to, I think they will feel incentive to parse it through that way just because, you know, I think that's kind of what people will want. Well, time is winding down here. And I seem, I'm sorry we didn't get to you on this one, but let me lead. I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question and I'll lead off with you on the next one. But uh, since we just have a few minutes left, I want to just uh, do my CLE duties uh, now before I ask that last question. Uh, and so here is um, the uh, the passcode for CLE credit. And I think that you will see in the chat uh, the forms that you can fill out. The passcode is MAPS. Again, that is MAPS, M-A-P-S. Uh, and case does not matter as you're typing that in. Uh, we also welcome your feedback on this panel, and there uh, should separately be an evaluation form placed in the chat, which can be completed anonymously. Okay, so the, the second question that I have, and actually I'm going to just try to jam a couple of questions in together, and we'll, we'll let, let anyone uh, take this as they want. One was meant to be a predictive um, question about the Voting Rights Act case, Aaron gave some thoughts on that. And we really have, you know, a spectrum of possible outcomes there from the doctrine being left mostly intact, which probably is unlikely, to uh, being completely, uh, having Section 2 being uh, completely invalidated on constitutional grounds. And so if any of you have thoughts on where we're likely to land on that, but uh, let me fold that in with another um, question. Which, which came from the audience and which I think is an interesting one. Do you have thoughts, because I've seen your comments very helpfully pointed out that a lot of the action here is happening at the state level. Uh, do any of you have thoughts on states that are managing to handle redistricting particularly well and that should serve as models for other states in terms of their process, in terms of how they handle partisan gerrymandering uh, or the representation of minorities? So it seemed ju just a minute left, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start with you. Sure, I'll give a short answer. Um, so, I mean, I think to the second question, you know, I think I think we can look to states that have really robust, well-designed independent redistricting commissions as sort of the model for how the process should work. Um, the Michigan Independent Redistricting Commission, I think, did a very good job. Um, it was sort of a model of a process. Uh, of course, you know, process doesn't guarantee perfect outcomes. There are independent redistricting commissions that operated quite well from the perspective of some metrics that ultimately, you know, drew maps that violated federal law, um, and that's bound to happen. But um, with good process, we can at least sort of hope for better outcomes. Um, but just to touch back on the independent state legislator doctrine, I will say that a maximalist, uh, sort of a maximalist adoption or adoption of a maximalist sort of version of the independent redistricting or independent state legislator doctrine, sort of, I, I fail to see how that would square with them. Um, uh, keeping Arizona State Legislator versus Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. Um, I think that sort of adoption would really put 
that case into question and would, you know, put into question the viability and use of independent redistricting commissions at all. So. Any final thoughts from other panelists on, on model states or on a likely outcome with respect well, to Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act? I, I think the likeliest outcome on the VRA is that they write an opinion where they talk about the importance of the VRA and do a bird of itch, which basically um, makes it much harder to use without facially gutting it. Now, I could be wrong. We're in a very different court and, you know, it's a maximalist court and I could, I could be completely wrong, but I, I think that they will say something like, um, well, if you can't draw a second black district in Alabama without complying with all of the state's race, quote unquote, race neutral rules, then you have no obligation to do so. And, you know, the, then states will basically enact all kinds of race neutral rules that um, will be difficult to ever have minority <laughs> districts in, and that will serve the purpose of, of this. And so I think, um, I suspect that that's where they will end up. They shouldn't, but because like, you know, the reality is, to, you know, um, it, like section two is already like really, really hard to use. Like very few section two cases are brought, very few are successful. Um, you know, you have to show a lot of things, um, and it's like really, really hard under the way the Supreme Court has already limited. It. So I, you know, like, but you know, here we are. All right. Well, I guess here we are is a good place to end. Uh, thank you uh, all, uh, all of the panelists, again for your uh, your comments for taking the time to do this. Uh, thanks to the audience. For um, for joining us today, you know this really is a timely topic and one that you're going to be hearing a lot more about in the months to come. And so this might not be the last event that uh, that we do on this. So uh, again, thanks uh, to all of you. This recording uh, will be posted online.